If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves wanting. From the same old fire and we've all run the things we know just ain't right and there's a better life there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain table if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need free was lost I walked away the road was dark I could not see my hope was gone the pain was real but your mercy you saw my steps felt my fears, you heard my cries, you caught my tears, arms open wide, you ran to me with your mercy, your mercy.
Good morning. I'm really tired today. We had a big like um, to do at, uh, where we live, and I'm not telling you because we don't want anybody to come out there. But we have this big like uh, neighborhood thing once a month, and it's really pretty awesome. And it was at our house. So more than anything, I was super super nervous because I don't cook much. No, I don't cook well, I should say. So I just did hamburgers and hot dogs, so it all worked out. But I know that's not why I'm up here. But anyway, welcome to Woodstown Presbyterian Church. Really excited that you're here. And um, you can uh, log on to any kind of social media, letting and check in and say, hey, you're here worshiping with us today. My name is Sue Bestwick. I'm one of the elders here. I'm a proud member at Woodstown Presbyterian Church. Uh, I've been here, uh, I don't know, almost a decade now. And probably what I like most about this church is that it's so dynamic. It moves, it changes. And you know, sometimes change is really hard for us. And you know, we're still going through a, a change as it is, and we'll, you know, we're gonna have all sorts of new things coming up. I invite you and encourage you to see um, our new worship leader down in um, at the big church, as my husband says, at the big church. Uh, where do you hear uh, the, the organist and the pianist? Oh, it's incredible music. So that's another really positive change. Um, we're really excited that you're that you're here, and um, it, there should be communication cards in front of you, and those communication cards are for you to fill out if you have a prayer request. If you're new, have never been here before, fill it, it out, and I believe we're still giving to the 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 family or to the per or to. Oh my gosh, food pantry. Thank you. Yes, we're giving to the food pantry. Gosh, I love audience, you know, participation. But um, at this point, I want to say thank you, and uh, our praise team will be up here. Oh, we have announcements. I forgot. We have some announcements. Thanks. Good morning, and welcome to Woodstown Presbyterian Church. Over the next month, we are going to transform our church into a tropical VBS, and we need your help. There is something for everyone, whether you can give a few hours the week before VBS or help out by putting decorations together at home. Check out the back table for projects that you can grab and go. Oh, and you don't have to be artistic to make a child smile this summer. Have you ever looked around on a Sunday morning and thought, I don't know half the people here? Or maybe you thought, I don't know that many people from the other service. This summer, we will have a monthly Friday fire around our new fire pit. Each month will be a little different. We might roast marshmallows, have games for teens, maybe a movie. Something family friendly and aimed to create a space of fellowship for our church family to get to know each other better. Join us for one, two, or all three. We are asking the congregation to pay for our Dominican Republic mission team as they travel to the DR this summer. Want to be a part of the team without going all the way to the DR? Grab a team member's name to pray for in the back of the sanctuary off of our prayer tree. You will be the prayer warrior for this team member as they prepare and throughout the trip. Coming soon, all church services will be streamed live from our website, YouTube, and Facebook pages. To watch our services, simply go to woodstownchurch.com and click Watch Now. Here's this week's schedule. We are happy you are here this morning. Let's get ready to worship. Good morning, peace be with you. We invite you to stand and pass peace to your neighbor. Thank you for being here. We're so grateful to be here with you, and we ask that you remain standing as we sing How Good Our Father Is.
forgive us for the times that we do not turn to you, that we do not lean on you, and we think that we can do it ourselves, and that we're self-sufficient. But thank you, Lord, for being there, that we can fall on you when times are tough, when it's a wonderful place that our heart and our lives are. Spirit, fill us this day. Be with our church. Help us as we strive to serve you and glorify you. Lord, we ask you to be with our pastor, Aaron. Speak through her today, Lord. Open our hearts and our minds that we can hear your word and your message to each one of us and that we don't forget it once we go out those doors that we take it into our hearts and we keep it there and we use it as we are witnesses for you every day no matter what we are doing and no matter what we're saying Lord, we pray for the leaders of our church. We pray for our PNC. We pray for each and every person here today who has taken the time and, and gone to the effort of not lying in bed or not just sitting outside drinking a cup of coffee, but who came here today, Lord, to worship you because you are so worthy. Thank you, Lord. Lord, now hear our prayer as we remember those words that you taught your disciples and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven.
together. Good morning. Everybody welcome to worship. And uh, we're going to take this time. I invite our ushers forward um, to continue on in our worship together this morning as we give back to God what's God's and present um, his tithes and our offerings. So I invite you to do that now. And you're here. You're the provider. I've ever needed Jesus you supply You're here with wonder working power Everything you breathe on coming back to life Have a mention of your Chain will break. I know everything will change. Jesus, just a whisper of your name. The silence went down waves at the mention of your name. All right, church, so good morning again. Everybody, welcome to worship on this uh, cow tipping Sunday. We're in week number three of summer. It's hard to believe that uh, the 4th of July is right around the corner, isn't it? 
This was like the quickest June ever, I feel like. But um, so far, we're uh, three minor profits deep into uh, cow tipping. Uh, you might have been here with the youth a couple weeks ago when we talked about Jonah. Last week, we talked about Joel. And uh, this week, we are going to introduce a new prophet. And I have to tell you, if I uh, fall asleep in the middle of my sermon, it's because um, la- this is a recital weekend for the Mara girls. So we were out till 11 p.m. last night <laughs> with my four-year-old and my seven-year-old. This is them last night. Um, this is the benefit of being uh, the one up on stage. I get to put pictures of my kids up. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I actually have a purpose in doing this this morning. I was thinking about it this morning, and you know, as a pastor, you work on your sermon throughout the week, and you, you spend most of the time, hopefully, in the text and in the scripture and thinking, and so I'm thinking about the prophet, and I realized this morning um, that I didn't have a sermon intro. I was like, oh, I can't just get up there and start talking about the prophet. I got to get something to grab their attention, and then I realized I was thinking about last night, thinking about this morning, and what's interesting, so, you know, there's a hundred plus girls who were all involved in the recital, it goes late last night, and of course, a lot of the, them are talking about going home and sleeping in, and I'm like, there's no sleeping in for me. I got to get up at five, and this morning, to wake the girls up at 7.30 to bring them here, but it was really interesting, because it made me think about the times and, and just probably hours of conversations that Robert and I have had about prioritizing, you know, worship and church and our faith for our kids. And it's really easy uh, when your kids are little to say that, you know, like before their lives get busy. Um, and I have never been a dance mom before. I was not a dancer. I did gymnastics. I played field hockey, ran track, swam, did all of that. Um, but this whole dancing thing is new to me, people. Like putting on, putting makeup on my four-year-old, and you know, and then I look over and the mascara's here and the lipstick's there. And I'm trying to keep them entertained backstage for three hours in between their performances and all of that. But they did a great job. But it made me think, and I was asking the question of um, priorities. And that's actually a big part of what we're going to talk about this morning through the prophet that we're going to talk about, which is Amos. And Amos kind of, um, and a lot of prophets do that, speaks into the kingdom of Israel, the people of Israel, about their priorities. I mean, that's ultimately one of the things that he is getting at, what matters most to them. We're going to talk about Amos this morning, and for those of you who might not be familiar with what we're doing this summer and what this whole cow tipping thing is about. It's just identifying each week something that kind of prevents us from moving forward in our faith or from growing as a people of God, from being on the mission that we're called to be on. And we're calling that the sacred cow that kind of gets in our way. And then we're coming up with some practical tips to tip that cow. I promise I won't say this every week for 12 weeks, just maybe the first three or four. Um, And so that's what we're going to do this morning with the prophet Amos. And so I kind of promise each week to start a little bit about context and background and the theme and what's going on with Amos. And a lot of you have probably heard of Amos. He is one of uh, the more famous uh, minor prophets because he has a verse, which we'll read about later, that talks about justice flowing like a river, right? And if you remember, gosh, it's probably been uh, seven or eight years since we did our summer of dive into trouble about justice. We actually used that, Amos 524, as our theme for the summer. So we're familiar with it. Um, But Amos, he is one of the earliest prophets who writes. So he's really early, so we're kind of starting and working our way chronologically. Um, Tells in the beginning of the book that he was a breeder of livestock, a tender of mulberry figs. He's actually from the southern kingdom of Judah. This helps us to date Amos because Judah and Israel are split, they're kingdoms, right? So there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And Judah actually lived in Tekoa. Uh, which is about five or six miles southeast of Bethlehem and about 18 miles from the Dead Sea. So if anyone has visited um, Israel, you kind of get an idea. You might have gone to this place. And um, we also are helped out by knowing of the kings that he talks about. He talks about in the southern kingdom in Judah, King Uzziah. And in Israel, in the northern kingdom, he talks about Jeroboam II. So that helps kind of date us as to where Amos was. So think about it. Think about where Amos is in the history of Israel. They're split into two kingdoms. So Israel has, you know, okay, they've wandered, they've come, they've conquered, they've become God's promise, they've they've fulfilled and lived into the promise God gave them, became God's people. Um, This is way after, you know, King David and all of that. And now they've split into these two kingdoms. This is actually after the Assyrian rule, which if you know anything about kind of ancient uh, history there, 
Assyria was one of the first kingdoms that kind of conquered and ruled. And actually, in the time that Amos is prophesying, Israel is very prosperous. They are actually living the good life. Um, they are not under foreign rule. They're not living under a conquered um, Assyrian rule. They're prosperous. They're wealthy. Things are looking good. So Amos becomes kind of known as the prophet who's the fighter for justice. Um, he speaks on behalf of the oppressed and the poor, and that become, becomes one of the main themes in his book. And so a lot of the judgment that he is prophesying that God will bring has to do with the injustice against the poor for Israel. It has to do with um, kind of their, so they're kind of continuing on. They still worship. They still sacrifice. They're still kind of, from the outside, look like the people of God that God called them to be. Um, but what Amos is pointing out is that there's a great injustice that's happening, that they're not treating those around them the way they're called to be. They're not, um, they, they've allowed their wealth um, to inflict poverty on others. And so this is kind of one of the main themes that Amos focuses on. What's really interesting is when he starts his book, after we get a little history of Amos, there's actually three different judgments. And I don't know this for certain. This isn't like a scholarship claim, but it sounds to me like Israel wanted, to, or I'm sorry, Amos wanted to get the attention of the people where he was prophesying. Because the very first judgment is not against Judah. It's not against Israel. It's against every surrounding nation that is around them. So when you first start reading the book, it's all of these kind of judgments that will come on the neighboring uh, people of Israel. And then in chapter 2, for just verses 4 and 5, just two little verses, he actually does prophesy judgment against Judah, where he's from, the northern, or I'm sorry, the southern kingdom, his hometown. And uh, the theme of that is idolatry, that they're kind of worshiping other gods, and he calls them out, and then he jumps right into the third judgment, which is the judgment of Israel. And Israel, uh, again, the theme of the oppression of the poor, injustice, that they have gained this wealth, but at the expense of of the poor. And this is where the majority of his judgment kind of focuses. And so what Amos is kind of getting at and the theme that we're looking at today is that in a time of prosperity, Israel forgets who she is. That she gets, she's in this time of prosperity, she doesn't have a foreign nation that's conquered her, or ruling her, things are good, There's, they don't look around and see famine and poverty, um, their fields aren't destroyed, which is often the case uh, when there's a context of prophecy. No, it's the complete opposite. But in this time, Israel forgets to be the very um, people that God has called her to be. Now, I will mention this. Amos is nine chapters long, and in the ninth chapter, there is the promise of restoration. Amos makes that clear, that you will be restored. But different from last week, how we talked about Joel, Joel, if you remember last week, calls Israel to do three things we talked about, to repent, to pray, and to fast. Israel does that, and Israel is restored. All right? In this case, this is much more typical for a prophet where Amos is prophesying about what will come. We know this kind of in hindsight, historically looking back, that it's the Babylonians that will come, they will conquer, and that Israel will be exiled. But at the end of Amos, Amos says, but that's not the end of your story. God, there is judgment, there's punishment that comes, but you will be restored. So we're going to deal with a little bit of a different sacred cow uh, this week. And what we're going to talk about is exactly what I've been focusing on in the last first couple minutes, which is prosperity. And kind of prosperity in um, a sense of security and comfort. And what I want to do is take a look at how Amos addresses that with Israel and how then that is relevant for us today. So, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, prosperity in Israel. The problem is that prosperity has led to oppression of the poor, has led Israel to be a, per, a people that God has not called them to be. And so Amos is not just simply getting up and saying, hey, you guys are prosperous and you're wealthy and that's bad and you're bad. No, that's not it at all. He says, what is the root of it? And what are you doing with the prosperity that you have? So the focus more is kind of around the question of when our comfort and our security, when we're secure, when we're prosperous, when we're living in comfort, what is kind of our response and what does that create in us? Um, does it become more important and more a part of our identity than the very identity in which God has placed in us and the people that God has called us to be? One of the things that I think about when I read Amos, and it's definitely a a prophetic book, if you read it from beginning to end, there's a lot of doom, there's a lot of 
um, what can be perceived as negative but really truth-telling and things like that. And it's a very kind of dark book. Like I said, it ends on that positive note of restoration, but there is a lot in there. And one of the things that Amos is kind of, um, in, in my own words, not his of course, kind of saying to the community of Israel is, you know, things can change like that. Remember where you've come from. Let me remind you of where you've been. Let me remind you of what you've been through and what happens every time that you turn away from God, that you allow something to distract you from God, to become a priority for you over your faith. This time specifically, it's wealth, it's prosperity, it's luxury. Um, and when that happens, then here's what happens. And it's constant. And so you may be prosperous and wealthy today, but what can happen kind of overnight? The things can look very different and they can change in an instant. And I have a clip I just want to show you to kind of give you this mindset of this and then I'll say something about that in a moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I came here 15 years ago with 21 cents in my pocket. I know a lot of us at the table have a story like that. And, you know, I can't help thinking that if we can start out there and end up here, where can't we go in America? Mm -hmm. So as corny as it sounds, I'd like to propose a toast to the future. <laughs> because out here, my friends, the sky is literally the limit. To the future. To the future. There were no suicides on Wall Street that day. It was a myth that would grow over time. The real effect of October 29th took a little longer to sink in. By noon, all the gains of the previous year had been obliterated. By 4 p.m., nearly $10 billion of market value was gone. Over the next two weeks, the hemorrhage continued. And before long, 25% of the workforce was unemployed. A great national migration began. Displaced families took to the American highway in the last possession that remained to them, their automobile. And all at once, millions of Americans had a new definition of home. All right, so just to be clear, what this message is not about is God's judgment on America. Not going there, okay? But what I did want to use this as um, an example of is... Um, the way that things can change like that, especially when we're talking about uh, financial security and comfort, prosperity, wealth, luxury, all of that, how that can seem like it's what defines us, and then it can be gone like that. And that's what Amos is warning. That's his word to Israel. Now, we know that Israel does not heed that warning, that they continue to do the exact same thing that has led them away from God and are led further away into exile. And it will not be the generation than Amos prophesies to, who hear and respond faithfully. It will be generations later where that will happen. So let's take a look just to dig into Amos at a couple of the warnings that he gives, talk about how that's relevant for us today, and then I have some just real simple and concrete tips for us as ways that we can respond so that we can choose to kind of heed the warning, to hear it, and to respond. Um, so there's three different warnings that Amos gives. Just to highlight a little bit of it, he talks about the first, well, he actually gives a number of them. I'm going to focus on three. One has to do with uh, corrupt worship, meaning, like I said, Israel is continuing to worship. They're continuing to sacrifice, to do all the things that they're supposed to do as a worship community. Um, but Amos addresses that it's not... Um, coming from the right place in their heart, and therefore it's corrupt. He also talks about, uh, gives a warning to those who feel secure, who feel secure because of the prosperity and because of the wealth. And so instead of their security being found in God, it's being found in their prosperity um, at that moment. And that out of that, they have become 
um, what he calls luxury loving rich, meaning that that becomes kind of the key to their security, their comfort, and their identity. And so um, if you have a Bible and you want to open it up to the prophet Amos, I'm going to read a little from chapter 5 and a little from chapter 6 just to give you a feel for kind of some of these warnings and what he is saying to the people of Israel. So in Amos 5, beginning with chapter 21, here is his warning as to uh, the worship. He says, um, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sakath your king, and Kaiwan your star god, your images, which you made for yourself. Therefore I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is in the God of hosts. And so it's really simple. Israel is saying there's no way that if you live in a way of injustice, if you do not show justice and take care of those who you're given to take care of, if you allow your wealth to then create others, uh, poverty and poor and uh, uh, such an injustice around you, then there's no way that your worship can be genuine. And out of that, they've even created other gods. So that's the first problem he's addressing. And he goes on in chapter 6 and he talks about um, feeling secure and kind of the love for luxurious things over the identity of being God's people who would care for the poor, who would care about the injustice. He says this, he says, Alas, for those who are at ease in Zion and those who feel secure on Mount Samaria, the notables of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel resorts, cross over to Cana and see. From there, go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is your territory greater than their territory? O oh, you that put far away the evil day and bring near a reign of violence. Alas, for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David improvise on instruments and music, who drink wine from bowls, and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away." So he's speaking to their success, their prosperity, their wealth of Israel, in the kingdom of Israel, and how that has led them away from God. And the evidence of this is that they have neglected to use the very prosperity, wealth, and things that God has given them to not only honor God, but to do that specifically through caring for the poor. And so what I want you to hear this morning is that what, what uh, Amos is putting out there to Israel is that, yes, you are prosperous, but how are you using that prosperity? If you kind of think about it, not just through the prophets, but yes, definitely it is a theme in many prophets, especially that of Amos, but throughout Scripture, whether you read a psalm, whether you look at the first, the Old Testament, especially the first five books when God is developing his people, the teachings of Jesus, there is one thing that is very clear, that God has a special place in his heart for the poor, and that he calls his people um, to take care of them. And so Amos is kind of calling this out in Israel saying, you know this of yourself, you know this of your call, of your identity, of you know this of the heart of your father, and yet you neglect it. And what's interesting is, yes, don't get me wrong, Amos is speak, speaking in a very literal way of poor, those who are not, he's pointing out the towns around them and saying, what makes you think you're better than them? Why should you be where you are and they should be where they are? It's not because you deserve better. You're supposed to take care of them. And so he's talking about a very literal sense of poverty, right? Basic needs. But there's a theme of that. There's also the theme of just those who are, who are poor in spirit, who are God has a special place in his heart for those who need to be cared for. Whether it's like in Psalm 34, the psalmist declares it this way. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. 
This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the, rem the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears, and he rescues them from their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So it all kind of ties together that God has a special place in his heart for those who are in need, whether it's physical need, emotional need, spiritual need, whatever that need is, that God has a place in his heart. And what do we know about our identity in Christ and our call as God's people is that if it's dear to God's heart, it should be dear to our heart. Is that true? Yeah. And that's what he's saying here through the prophet Amos is how could you have forgotten this? This is part of who you are. How could you be okay with this? It's not just in the prophets. Jesus continues. Do you remember Jesus' reaction when the temple was being misused? Right? When it became about making money instead of worship. And what did Jesus do? He went into the temple. It tells us this in, in several of the Gospels. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He overturned tables. And it says he overturned the seats of those who sold doves. I wonder if those who were selling doves were sitting in the seats when he overturned them. It doesn't say they weren't. We see this image of righteous anger when there's an abuse of what we should be doing as God's people, of who we should be as God's people, right? And Jesus not only is... Um, it responds in this way to this, but he makes it very clear, and he's very consistent in his teaching. Remember, in, in all of the Gospels, except the Gospel of John, there's this one um, lesson where the guy comes to Jesus, and he asks him the question about following him, right? What do I need to do? And what does Jesus say? He says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Says he loved him. And said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the, to the who? Poor. To the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. And if you know this story, you know the response, that the man's unable to do it. And Jesus makes the point. And the point is this, that money can come between us and God, our wealth, our identity in that. That becomes the most important thing, and even God doesn't seem so important. Amos is saying, Israel, this is what's happened to you. You have forgotten who you are. You have forgotten your history. You have forgotten who you're called to be. And so my question for us this morning is how is this relevant to us today? And what maybe can we hear from the prophet this morning? Where is it that we are prospering? What is the time that we are in? And so this morning when we talk about tipping that cow, I want to address three different types of prosperity. Of course, it is obvious and evident. You cannot read the book of Amos without understanding financial prosperity. Yes, that is in there, right? And of course, we're going to address that. But the message that Amos has for Israel is simple. He's saying you're in a time of prosperity that was, by the way, provided to you by God. He has already restored you several times or returned you several times or called you back or built you up again or forgiven you and given you another chance. But you haven't used that to honor God and to reflect his love to those around you, to be the people that he's called you to be, specifically in worship and in treatment of the poor. They don't match up what you're doing and what you're saying. So there's these three types of prosperity, and we take the message in Amos, which is clear, which says, how are you using what God has given you to honor God and to serve those God calls you to serve? The message that Amos has. So think about it as I go through these three things. What has God given you, and how are you using it to honor him? Let's agree maybe together this morning to just check ourselves. Right? Because that's what Israel forgot to do. They would get so caught up in whatever it was, this time their wealth, their luxury, their prosperity, that they would forget to check to make sure they were still being the people that God called them to be. 
So let's talk about the three types of prosperity, and I'll just address the obvious one first, which is financial prosperity. And so if the cow we're trying to tip is prosperity, the tips that were helping us, <laughs> that's funny, the tips that are helping us to tip that cow um, would be things that would help us to keep God at the center of who we are, of our identity, of who we're called to be, and would allow the things in our life that are blessings, that are prosperity, um, to not only honor God, but to serve the people God calls us to serve. And so financial prosperity, much like he says uh, in the context that it's written, how do we view our financial resources and how do we use them? Let me be clear. Having financial security and prosperity is not sin, right? Israel, that's not the problem here. Amos isn't saying to Israel, you're too rich, you have too much wealth, and that's bad. You're bad because you have things. That's not necessarily what he's saying. Actually, it's not what he is saying at all. He's saying, but resting in that alone, finding your identity in that alone, and then not using that to do good for other people is, a matter of fact, gaining that wealth at the expense of others, right? So, like, a modern-day example of this is, like, you know, I own a business, and I don't take care of my employees, but I take care of myself first. And do you understand what I'm saying? So there's an ethical, moral concern there that's going on, and there's also um, neglecting God. So wealth at what expense? How do I get what I get, and then what do I do with what I have? Those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. I mean, let's agree, when we're talking about wealth, Let's give a simple definition of wealth, okay? Because it's easy to say, I'm not wealthy because I'm not a millionaire. I'm not wealthy because I don't make six figures. I'm not wealthy because I have bills. You know, that's easy. But what if we just define wealth as our basic needs are met and we still have things other than our basic needs, right? Let me give you an example. I told you I was at the dance recital yesterday. No big deal, just there from 1 to 11, my whole, my whole Saturday. And... Um, so they're going through the tech rehearsal and realizing in the grand finale you're supposed to have black sneakers. Well, I didn't know that. No, a lot of us didn't know that. Well, we had an hour and a half break for dinner. So um, I ran out with Adeline. Walmart was five minutes down the road, and I found the hairs of black sneakers for $5.97. And so I bought one for each of the girls, and this is a win. Five bucks. All right, great. And uh, we grabbed some dinner, and we went back. That, that is wealth. That is prosperity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's above what I need. I have the ability, I get it, it's 10 bucks, but I have the gas in my car to get to Walmart, to buy the shoes, to grab dinner for Adeline and I to get back, and by the way, my girls dance, which again, is above what we need. Are you following me here? So it's a simple kind of calculation. And so the practical tip for us when it comes to financial prosperity is to think about our priorities. To think about the, um, the way we give back, and sure, I mean the way we give back, are we giving to God what's God's, are we, are we tithing, are we giving God um, what he asks of us, yes. But also, the special place that God has in his heart for the poor, and how do we use our financial prosperity uh, to serve others. And so, I just think of a couple really simple tips. And I was thinking, you know, our church does this in a lot of ways. And one of the ways, you might, everybody can turn around at one time, but that's the prayer tree back there for the Dominican Republic. Go ahead, guys, look. That's a prayer tray for the Dominican Republic mission team. And I'd love for you to grab, we have 13 team members, and they're all on there twice. All right, so you can grab a name, you can pray for that person. And one thing that comes to mind in a great way, I want you to think about how um, intentionally you and your family serve the poor. How do you do that? And how, and how can you do that? Is there something you can do once a week or something you can do once a month? You know, one of the things I thought about, we have 24 kids that we're trying to get sponsors for, uh, Buen Samaritano at the orphanage that we work with in the Dominican Republic, and I think we have about 10 or 11 sponsors. So that's a really great way that a family can acknowledge that. They can pray for that kid. They can send letters and cards and really build a relationship. And you even have the possibility one day for you and your family to get on a plane and go with us down to the DR and meet the very kid that you've been sponsoring, Right? Um, and, and I really have a lot of respect for a number of our Dominican Republic mission team folks because they give up a week. A lot of them, that's one of the two, three, or four weeks of vacation that they get a year, and they spend it on a mission trip. Um, and they, they sacrifice that. And I think about that. What's the practical way that the prosperity that you have in your life can be given back? You know, can you serve... Um, I believe the new ministry that we're working out with Anne's Abbey, and I'm sorry, Val Wiest isn't here. She's in charge of this. Her or Patty Elwell, you can ask. But when we've been helping out at Anne's Abbey, it's a home down the street. Um, 
And they requested a Bible study. They said, well, someone from your church come and do a Bible study here. And so now once a month, there's a group of about six or seven people that are going to go over there and spend some time with the members there, you know, giving back to the community. The same way, Sandwiches of Hope. I was thinking about that, I, and I was feeling a little bit of guilt because I used to take my girls, you know, once a month, and we would just go out and we would hand out sandwiches with Don in Bridgeton. And it was good exposure for them. So I think the, the financial prosperity thing is really a simple thing. I think what happens is we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. No one likes to talk about money. It's not fun. It's uncomfortable. And then we feel guilty for what we have. And that's not what Amos is saying. He's not saying to Israel, you should feel bad because you have so much. You don't hear that at all. He's saying you should do something different with what you have. Your wealth should not be at the expense of others. So it's actually a very simple message. We don't have to feel guilty about what we have. We just have to make sure that we are responsible in prioritizing what God has given us. It's not about guilt. It's about using what we have to honor God. But I want to apply the same type of thing, not just to financial prosperity, because not all of us probably are literally in financial prosperity. But there's another type that I want to talk about, which is spiritual prosperity. What does this mean? It means that we um, have kind of a... A, uh, let's say we're on a mountaintop in our spiritual life. Or we have a story to share of something that we have been through. And I wonder how we use the prosperity in our spiritual life, meaning the blessing, the testimonies, the things that God has done in our life to come alongside of other people. So I ask you the question this morning, how is your walk with God? Are you in a good place? Do you have a story to share, something that God has brought you through? Some way that God could use you to encourage someone or to invest in somebody else. Maybe you're comfortable in your faith, meaning that you have been a believer for a long time and, and you know the word of God, you're comfortable praying, whatever it is. And so maybe, just maybe, you could consider that God would want you to use that spiritual prosperity to help somebody else out. Maybe this is in the context of being poor in spirit. The way Jesus says in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed is he who is poor in spirit. So the practical tip that I would ask you to think about for spiritual prosperity is to think about what God has gotten you through and who in your life you can share that with. I don't know what that is for you. Maybe um, you've experienced loss and there's somebody that God would bring you alongside of to help with loss in their life. Maybe you've experienced overcoming something in your marriage and God would use you to help a friend or a couple in time of need. Maybe there is physical healing in your life that you've received. Maybe there is a financial struggle that God has pulled you through. You know, I think about it. Some of the most powerful groups that we have here at church are groups like Divorce Care and Grief Share or groups like... Um, Emotions Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous that help people. And the idea of those groups is what? People who have gone through some of the same thing come together, right? So, you know, like, for example, divorce care has to be led by someone who's been through a divorce because it's called walking with somebody through it. I've been, that, been down that road, and I'm going to walk with you through the same thing. And so I wonder if you're in spiritual prosperity. And understand me, I'm not saying your life is perfect, right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you figured it all out, that you have all the answers. But that maybe you have been through something that you have prospered from, and God is asking you to consider being there for somebody else. When it comes to spiritual prosperity, I think if we're not walking with someone, if we're walking alone we're probably missing an opportunity to share what God has done in our life with somebody. And finally, not just financial and spiritual prosperity, but there's also physical prosperity. And here's what I mean by that. It's not as, well, I guess it is kind of literal, but think about it. How's your health? Are you in good shape? Do you have a clean bill of health? Maybe there's a way that if we are prosperous, meaning that we are doing well in our health, that we can share that with others. And here's what I mean by that. Um, we, we had a, um, a scare just, a, I guess, a couple weeks ago with Adeline, our oldest. She, uh, we noticed one Saturday that one of her eyes was just suddenly crossing to the middle. And it was just very sudden and very dramatic. And we didn't really know what was going on. We thought maybe she was tired. Um, and so... 
you know, it was Saturday, then Sunday, same thing, still looked <laughs> strange, very noticeable, we couldn't figure it out, so took her to the pediatrician uh, Monday morning and had her checked out, and they recommended seeing a pediatric ophthalmologist and also that she should get an MRI, because it could either be muscular or neurological. Well, that's Monday, so um, Monday evening was not a very restful evening for me, I should be honest and say, because of course the minute someone says something about neurological concerns about your seven-year-old, you're, that's, you know, all of a sudden human, you go to the worst place, right? Um, so anyway, the long version, I'll tell you later, but the short version is it winds up, we, we had to go up for an MRI and we had to see the ophthalmologist and it winds up that it, mo that it is muscular and they're treating it with um, glasses and patching and she was um, such a rock star last Friday. She went and did the MRI without sedation. We were so proud of her. She's on the Hall of Fame at CHOP. Um, for sitting perfectly still for an hour in an MRI machine at seven years old, which impressed me. Um, but it was scary. But you know what I thought of almost that whole week? I thought of other parents, and I thought, especially you go to CHOP, and you just know that like what we're dealing with is like down here compared to what, and I started to imagine what it must be like to be a parent of a sick child, you know, and to have to just deal with that every single day. And it made me think about that. It made me think about um, what it means to walk alongside people when they're going through something that we are not going through or that we have been through. And I wonder how we can use our physical prosperity. Look, I don't know. Maybe you're in really good shape and there's somebody who wants to get in shape and you could walk alongside of them that. Maybe it's that simple and that kind of relationship and that kind of support, you know? Or maybe it is using some of your time to visit somebody who's not well, who's stuck in their home or stuck in a bed or stuck in a nursing home or something like that and doesn't have the type of um, relationship and communication. A lot of our Stephen ministers do that type of thing. And so I wonder, isn't there a practical tip for us to use kind of what God has given us, has blessed us with as far as our physical health to be able to visit someone who's struggling with health? to come alongside somebody and support them, even just in meeting a goal. So I don't know if it's financial, spiritual, physical, if it's two of the three, if it's all three, or maybe, you know what, it's none of them right now. But I want you to think about this morning, where is your prosperity? Or another way of saying that, where have you been blessed? Where have you been given an abundance? And how are you honoring God with that prosperity? If the cow we're tipping is prosperity, abundance, overflow, blessing, the things in our life that God has given us, it's not because it's bad to be prosperous. It's that it matters what we do with that prosperity. It matters that it honors God. It matters that it reflects the image of God in us and that it's in line with who God calls us to be. Whether it's financial, spiritual, or physical, Maybe this morning, God's inviting you just to tip that cow, to take that first step. Whether it's serving the poor as a family, maybe adopting one of the kids in the orphanage, maybe committing to serve in some type of manner together. Or maybe God's asking you to commit your financial resources differently. I'm not quite sure what the answer is to that. Or it might be just simply coming alongside of somebody and walking with them in faith, being a support, sharing your story. Not assuming that what God has gotten you through was just for the sake of getting you through it, but maybe it was to take you and to be an encouragement or an inspiration to somebody else. Or maybe even simpler than that, God's calling you just to sit with someone, to visit someone, to honor someone's humanity whose physical strength isn't what yours is. But the bottom line is this. That as God's people, we're called to use what God has prospered us with to bring honor to his name and to draw others to know him. And really, no matter what type of prosperity it is, your prosperity should help others to prosper as well. Let us pray. Lord God, it probably depends on the time in our life and where we are, Lord. Maybe sometimes it's abundantly clear how you have um, prospered us, how you have blessed us, how we have an abundance of spiritual strength or financial resources or physical strength. And maybe other times it's not. But I do pray this morning that we would 
accept that kind of internal challenge that you're giving us, Lord, that we would heed the warning of the prophet Amos, that we're to take the things that you give us and turn them back out into the world to honor you and to invest in others. And I pray, Lord, the same way that you have a heart for those who are in need, whether it's a physical need, a financial need, a spiritual need, whatever that need is, Lord, you are a God who responds to that and who wants to take care of that. And I pray that that same heart would need in us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing our last song.
morning, and you are, right? Are you here? Yeah, there you go. Um, you're here this morning. I want you to know that God wants you to shout it, just like the song cries out for all of us to do, to shout it from the mountaintops, and that God, whatever God has blessed you with, whatever is your source um, of overflow, well, God is your source, you know what I mean, but whatever God has given you, there is somebody or some group or some way that God wants you to use that to honor him and to reach somebody who otherwise might not be reached. And I just pray that you would not take that lightly, that you would remember that as a child of God, as a brother or sister in this family, that you are called to use what God has given you to share who he is with others. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, May the love of God the Father and friends, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit inspire you, guide you, and lead you now and forevermore. May you go in peace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.